everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the PVD Horror Podcast. I'm Dave. I'm here with my co-host, Brandon. And today we have guests Gary Smart and Christopher Griffiths, who are here to talk to us about their amazing new horror documentary called Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares, The Robert England Story, which will be on Screenbox and Digital June 6th of 2023. And this is the documentary that I think everybody has been waiting for. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. No problem. So you guys developed a production company called Cult Screenings UK. Can you guys let the listeners know a little bit, a little bit about the company and some of the projects you guys were able to create? Yeah, sorry. I've got two really noisy dogs, so they're part of the podcast now. Okay. Uh, no um, <laughs> they need to get credited. Uh, so yeah, we kind of started off doing Cult Screenings about 10 years ago, probably it was, I think, 10 years. Um, and we, it was originally set up to do film screenings. We put a film on and we get some guests from, from the movie. The first one we did was uh, Return of the Living Dead uh, with my very close friend, Don Kaufer, who was the, an actor in that film. Awesome. And Don came over from the UK uh, and basically, you know, did a talk about the film. It was a really brilliant evening, you know, a little, little cinema in Birmingham, uh, which is in obviously the UK. Uh, and then Chris turned up as a patron, the guest, we want to call it. You know, he paid for a ticket, turned up, uh, was very cheeky because he had to get a train back home uh, on that evening. So he's going to miss the Q&A at the end. So he um, basically asked me, could he meet Don privately? And I kind of like Chris straight away. I, don't, I think I didn't he, say privately. Yeah. I just said yeah, I was running did. late. Don't make me sound like that. He did. He was like Christ. proper prima donna asking for it. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, you kind of instantly kind of connect with people, don't you, straight away. And I, think I, just, I just like Chris straight away. You know, I think you could tell he was a film fan. We probably had a chat about the film itself, obviously, whilst we were waiting for Don in his dressing room. And then that was it. Our relationship started there in terms of obviously becoming friends on Facebook and whatnot. And then we did a screening of... Um, Sorry, this dog's irritating me. We did a screening <laughs> of um, uh, Hellraiser, which Chris couldn't come to. And we did a screening then of Manhunter with Brian Cox, obviously now famous for Succession. And uh, I knew Bro I knew uh, Chris was a huge fan of uh, Brian, uh, of uh, Manhunter. Uh, he was obviously, you know, I saw on his Facebook, he was, you know, he's a very much, you know, Michael Mann fan and obviously the original Hannibal Lecter. So I asked Chris, would he do the interview? Chris agreed. Uh, and then it kind of was, you know, after that, uh, really, you know, we bonded even more on our love for film and, and geekiness and whatnot. <laughs> and um, basically, I said to what one day, it may have been with Chris or somebody else, I can't remember who it was, you know, let's do our own documentary. I'd worked on uh, the documentary called More Brains, A Return to a Living Dead, mm -hmm. uh, with our friend Tommy Hudson and Mikey Perez. I'd written a book on that film, obviously, my friendship with Don. And then obviously, they asked me to write the doc. So, by writing the doc, I kind of learned how to do the narrative of a documentary and the transcribing and how. A documentary kind of works really from from the kind of like the edit point of view on paper as opposed to edit obviously on on, on a computer um and that was it we kind of decided to do how raise that it went to be like a little baby project which was going to be just shot in the uk over a few months and that snowball got chris on board as a kind of co-director in the end i mean chris kind of directed did it if we're being honest now we can probably we probably can say that now after 10 years we won't get sued Good. By the director. Finally, but yeah, he, yeah, the but chris, yeah but chris directed did it really I and mean, at first he wasn't on board as director but i think his role will evolve and obviously we were more serious about the project than obviously our actual director was so um that was it really i mean the script the company took on and then uh we enjoyed leviathan did brewster and then obviously saddled ourselves with pennywise and robodoc and police academy and obviously the navis project so that's kind of very short biography obviously how me and chris became uh a civil partnership, basically. <laughs> civil <laughs> partnership. <laughs> he is like my second wife. He's worse than my actual wife, trust me. <laughs> Chris, do you have a take on that? Because I, I feel like you... Uh, you this is to, a, you It's absolute to... fabrication oh, okay. bullshit. No, he, 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 he wooes me. Gary's got a habit of employing like guys who are younger than him. And Oh, wait, no, sorry, I shouldn't say that, should I? You know, like Liberace. Um, <laughs> no, so... Um, yeah, no. It's this like was before character. hashtag me too, wasn't it? It's was before hashtag me too. <laughs> yeah, we got away with it. Then. it was, yeah, Vogue. No, but um, yeah, like Gary said, you know, it's a mutual love of films, mm -hmm. um, where where we kind of probably differ a bit, and I think it helps for our relationship. Gary's very much '80s horror specific, mm -hmm. you know, and I adore, I, you know, Friday the Thirteenth, got them all, all the slashers and everything like that. But 
I suppose it works well in terms of this project. I really love my kind of 70s films. I love my thrillers, dramas, and everything like that. Hmm. So that kind of really works for this documentary, I suppose, aptly. Because yeah. Yeah. we've, you know, we, what we've done up to this point is, you know, I suppose talking in terms of the projects as a whole, we've been very, very independent. We started 10 years ago. The projects do <laughs> take their sweet ass time because we've still got full time jobs to this very day. And we've had them crowdfunded, which comes with its own little dramas here and there, as you can imagine. Um, and yeah, it's it's a love, it's a passion, it's a hobby, but it's doing a eight till six for work in the day, get home, do cooking, jump on edits and be working till two o'clock in the morning. Still to this very day, we're doing that. Yeah. But we just, we absolutely love it, you know? And it's, I think the the main thing, we, we always use the uh, line when we're, you know, doing like Kickstarter videos is, we're making documentaries for fans as fans. And, you know, I've, I've, when DVDs came, uh, first came about, you know, for me, it was just like, oh my God, deleted scenes and making of, you know, I was getting my money to pick up like all the new releases every Monday when DVD first came about, like, oh my God, Terminator special edition. Oh my God, Robocop special edition and everything yeah. like that. And so I, I loved making of, and then to have a, a chance meeting with Gary at one of these events, I never, you know, I'm, I'm a, Poor for horror, but a bit like a closet horror fan, you know, because I've got my sporty social circles, you know, so I'm the black sheep in that respect. But to meet someone then by chance, the one time I go to an event, which was the Return of the Living Dead one, and I'd be like, holy shit, I could I could actually work on the making of these things. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, we've been very, very dedicated from the get-go. And it's been a bit of a roller coaster, really. You know, we've had some successful moments like uh boutique labels like arrow screen factory and everything and eureka acquiring our work which is like oh my god we've made it boys we're gonna be taking this full time next year <laughs> a decade later and here we are still you know but um i think it's in the advent now of you know the the lay of the land of the industry has really really changed now in terms yeah. of the legal side of things we were very much like operating you know gorilla really at the start you know, all the physical copies we made of our first docs were all being shipped straight out of Gary and Adam's um, bathroom <laughs> boxes. So you try and go for a pee in there. So some of them might actually inadvertently be signed by me, those copies. Probably. The pen, you know, because I missed the seat. <laughs> um, but now, like, we've just got to this point where I think streaming is a big factor, really, yeah. now. Yeah. And, like, finding, thanks to our producers, uh, you know, we've got Hank and Lawrence, who we took on in around covid time oh, didn't we, Gary? i think i'll let yeah, you know probably about four about three or four years ago yeah i forget when covid was now <laughs> but they, 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 they kind of like connected us you know like holy shit we could do this legit you know at least have some legitimate backing and distribution now um and so pennywise was really our foot in the door but we're as, <laughs> as gary's sort of partially alluded we're sitting on a big backlog of stuff that's still to come out yeah but yeah. all it's all finally starting to happen now it's just circumstance it's limitations we bit off more than we could chew i think in retrospect you know like oh my god we've made twenty thousand pounds on this kickstarter and then you've got other outfits out there making half a million and they're doing fine and then you're like oh shit yeah maybe 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 we should have got more money for these projects <laughs> um and then pennywise was our foot in the door oh, okay with, with this right. you know they, they took it on and then they like that and i don't really get involved much on that business side but then it's like oh we, <laughs> we've got this one that's still not come out oh we've got that one that's not come out and mm -hmm. they've been really gracious to take them on and in particular with this one uh, we had a lot of, um, Gary, I'm, I'm, well, we can't really allude, but we had a lot of interest in this particular project by distributors, some notable yeah. names I better mm -hmm. not mention. Um, and it was very, very, very much on all our parts a, no, we want to go with Screenbox. And it's purely because of just the, what they've done for us so far. You know, they're, they're a new company. So yeah. obviously, yeah. Gonna, you know, there's no ego about them. They're very much looking to make a name for themselves, but not just purely, yep, yeah, we'll take that and do that with it. You know, they've given us a mini theatrical release for this, a bloody steelbook's coming out, and I'm a yeah. whore for those things as well, even though they've kind of, you know, it's all about having fat box editions of everything now, isn't it? But, um, <laughs> you know, they've really nurtured this project thus far, even though it's not fully out yet. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, it's just just been a wild ride, and you get to meet all these people, and you know, like yes, it's you wild. just find like, oh, who haven't I met yet? Oh, that person. <laughs> Let's work with them. Let's fuck it. We'll we'll figure out what you know film we cover. But as long as we get to meet Ray Wise, Lance Henriksen, and God knows what. So yeah, sorry, mate. Yeah. This is the truth. Of, hopefully, we yeah. can extend this interview for you guys a bit with the time. <laughs> That's cool. So can you guys share the story on how you guys were able to get Robert to agree to be a part of this project? Because I hear he's not an easy guy to get a hold of these days. Uh, no, he, he's not. No, we were told he was going to be hard. We were told loads of things about city prices and that kind of stuff. And we mm -hmm. were lucky because there was two ways of getting Robert. One is obviously through your traditional route management. Mm -hmm. And obviously they were protected him, of course. They were, you know, free Brits, uh, you know, sending an email asking to do a documentary on someone's career may not go down very well you know why do these Brits want to do it you know there's big American companies out there you know there's some really established kind of uh, producers in in the states particularly with our friends who are very uh, uh, you know people like Tommy Hudson and Mikey Perez uh, and the other route obviously is Nancy uh, his wife Nancy England yep. and I um we were lucky because we we are friendly and well Mikey works with us on all these projects uh, with Mikey Perez uh, and Mikey was the producer on Never Sleep Again Crystal Lake Memories, More Brain. So he's been around the block a long time. Um, so he said to me, I've got Nancy's email address, you know, um, just email her, basically. So I did the cliche kind of bullshit where it's like a long email, you know, heartfelt. But actually, it was genuine. And I've got to admit, it was genuine. I just told her the truth. You know, I've been a fan of Robert since I was a small child. I remember going to primary school, which is basically you know, from the age of four upwards, with VHS copies of Not Around Street 2, loaning them out to my friends in school, having a full-size poster of Freddie Krueger in my bedroom door at the age of six, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, he's always been there in my life, Rob. Uh, Freddie has. And obviously, being a film fan, and particularly in the 80s, it was more difficult being a film fan because uh, he didn't have the internet. But knowing who Robert England was, even then, I knew who he was. Um, so I did all that, and obviously, you know, I basically said, you know, this is going to be about a celebration of his career, as and as opposed to just Freddie. And I had an email come back, very short and sweet, saying Robert would like to talk to you on Sunday at eight pm. Uh, obviously, I'd already given my number. Uh, I then, well, you know, yes, please, no problem. And you, you start thinking, is he going to call? You know, is he, you know, you, is this going to be one of those things where he's just busy and forgets? Mm -hmm. And then I was there like five to eight, like absolutely shitting myself, <laughs> and then eight o'clock my phone rings and it's Robert and the strangest thing about that conversation was it was straight into a kind of like um a relationship straight away a, a there was no ego no bullshit it was just a, a film fan talking to another film fan and he reminded me of my friend Don you know from Don Care from Return of the Living Dead who yeah. sadly passed, passed away a few years ago but Don was like Don would just get you wouldn't even say hello Don would it Don was straight in talking about a film did you watch that film last week did you do it it's like fucking hell Don give me a chance and <laughs> Robert was like straight away Robert was like so have you watched this film of mine? Tell me about this. Like, uh, and he was basically texting me a little bit on the on the phone. And I was obviously been I was able to mention quite a lot of films. And then Robert just said to us, you know, on on the that first phone call, if you know you're going to do a documentary about Freddy Krueger, I'm happy to be interviewed. You know, but if it's about my whole career, I'll give you everything. I you know you can have access to, to me as much as you want. You can have access to my archive. Uh, there are some films I'd like you to talk about, and some you know especially my comedies and stuff like that. And then we arranged to meet in London then uh, a few months later. This must have been in November, so maybe in the March, we met him in London. And again, me and Adam went down. Chris was unfortunately uh, definitely on a shoot with something. Chris was on that weekend. He was busy. So me and Adam went to London, met him and Nancy. And again, friendship kind of blossomed. And then next thing you know, we're in LA shooting interviews with him and obviously 40 other people. So that was it kind of really. It's one of those where if you don't ask, you don't get. And we... We asked and we got. <laughs> we were very lucky. I think he was surprised that nobody had asked him. So that was the kind of thing, really, as well. And Robert talked about us on the weekend, you know, very, very complimentary about me and Chris and Adam, of course, on the weekend uh, about how we are film fans. I think he kind of saw that in us straight away. But we're not just bullshitters who are trying to make a few quid. You know, we don't make anything from these. You know, we're still <laughs> working, as Chris, at nine to five. Uh, but we do it because we love film. And I think that was it, really. I think he kind of saw that in us straight away. Okay. So, um, you know, your, your documentaries, the, the ones you've already mentioned, uh, Pennywise, uh, Leviathan, like you guys do your homework. You definitely get everyone. And like, so we, we had a chance, uh, there was a screening of the Pennywise uh, doc with someone who was also involved in the, uh, in the film. 
uh, John Campopiano. Oh yeah, um, we know. Yes, of course we know John. Our, <laughs> he's from our area. Yeah, and he um, he's been on this oh, yeah. podcast before actually. So uh, we went to the premiere, and I was just like blown away at like the levels of depth within that documentary, and it just like really impressed me on like the homework, but also like the education that you guys brought. There was like a little piece about the history of clowns. And then to see like everybody that was involved. And then like, so when I came into this doc, I kind of had the same expectations and it was like, again, another super thorough piece. So like, I know you guys already kind of mentioned like the, the amount of time it takes you, but like, can you walk us through like how much time does it take to get all that information and research and how many people are involved in that kind of pro uh, process? I mean, I'll, I'll, go on, go sorry. On, go on, you start. Go on, you start. <laughs> I'll start on it. I'm very much involved in the pre-production on it. Obviously, this one we've worked very closely on this one massively, you know, as a producer. Uh, I've always been the business side of it, obviously getting the people, getting the processes, the pro the, the project started. Then Chris obviously has it's a creative element, obviously. Then, but this one we've worked kind of really both similarly, you know, with regards to the pre and post production, production and post on this one. But it's always the hardest part is always getting the people really uh, and obviously the scheduling. So it does take time, but there's not many of us, to be honest, you know, we've always, we, we learn we, as filmmakers, you learn as you go along. And I think we've brought people in before and we've had big teams of people and we've always ended up arguing with people, me and Chris and Adam have, I don't know what it, maybe it's us. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And I'm, I'm always one of those people, even at work now, I'd rather just do it myself. I know it's done then. Do you know what I mean? If I'm going to do something, just do it yourself because you know it's going to be done right. And I don't want to criticise people. And and, and I know because it, it's so hard to get hold of people. I don't want to go, why didn't you get so-and-so when actually it was really hard to get them? If I did it myself, I know how hard it is then. Um, so we we kind of reduced our team massively on this one because uh, of egos as well. It, when, as you develop it as filmmakers and the projects get better, there are egos. You know, unfortunately, yeah. it, just, it just happens. And when you have too many cooks, you spoil the broth, don't you? And that's, the, you know, we want this to be a very kind of intimate project, this one. So it's only really me, Chris, uh, Adam, our producer, uh, Mikey Perez, as I've already mentioned, our other producer, John Camper Piano, who's worked on this as an archivist. Uh, and um, obviously Peter came aboard as the editor and Richard Jackson was our cinematographer. And that was it really at one stage. Obviously, he's, he's got a little bit big, obviously, with, our, with Shane Gregory, our um, obviously uh, a motion graphics person, Eastwood Allen as a producer, Hank and Lawrence, and Sean Schaefer Hennessy, our composer. Um, it does develop, you know, Gareth, our animator. Um, but it's a long, long process. So I think we probably started the research normally on these projects about six months before. Um, and then obviously, that's, we try and get a narrative as, as strong as we can get to the interview and obviously Chris can mention how it changes massively during the interview stages um you know our first documentary Leviathan our second one uh Brewster with a perfect blueprint for us it was literally a year and a year so a year from pre-production to delivery mm -hmm. that went tits up on on Pennywise uh because of various issues but in terms of obviously the creative changes Chris on the uh, how the narrative changes, doesn't it? Really, on the actual edit, doesn't it? And the interviews. I think you're saying about well. you're saying about us doing the research. I mean, we're we're fucking geeks through and through. So to be <laughs> honest, there's a lot of stuff like yeah, yeah, I've listened to that commentary. Yeah, I read that book and watched that. You know, I mean, I, I'm absolutely. I, I mean, how I've been married for fifteen, oh shit, sixteen years is beyond me. I mean, I've had a tutor say to me in the past. I think when I was able to spill a bit of trivia about something, she's like. You're married. You've got a girlfriend of you. I'm like, yes, I do. Um, so we, there's a lot we already kind of know, you know, especially in the advent of the internet now. Everything's there at your disposal. God knows the amount of things that get regurgitated, recycled on Twitter as well. All these kind of like, did you know? And then yeah. linked to an article from 2014. Like, yeah, you know. But um, yeah, with like the pre-production, we like Gary said, we've kind of progressed as filmmakers. My first involvement in Leviathan was... Do you want to interview people like Pinhead and everything? It's like, oh, sure. So Gary does all the writing and everything, and he's more a wordsmith. I mean, I didn't really have much. I'd only just come out of university on that project. I did a little bit of video, but that was it. Really young, and yeah. Really, all I did was just sort of sit, yeah, not those videos, but just sit down <laughs> with like six pages per interview and just be like, how did you get this role? What was that like? Blah, 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 blah. And then you learn to be like, oh, God, if you just keep asking the questions, they're just going to give you the answers. Yeah. So you've got, to, you know, where we've developed a bit is about, God, it is about the characters, the delivery and everything like that. 
And then when it came to the edit, the traditional format was Gary would take all transcribes of all the interviews when it was a lot harder to transcribe interviews at that point as well, very manual. And then I would just sort of put that in the edit. He's put that on paper. There it is on the edit. I don't know what I'm doing. Done and dusted. And retrospectively, I mean, I think we're pr- still quite happy with the producer's cut we made for the Arrow release of Leviathan. But God, if you watch the original ones, you're like, oh my God, it's fucking amateur hour. <laughs> and then we like, had people come in who've educated us, both, you know, cinematographers, uh, you know, Eastwood with the editing on uh, Fright Night and RoboDoc. So it's, and that's what I'm really starting to enjoy now. It's like, ooh, edits, ooh, fancy things. And, mm-hmm. you know, you learn these new cool tricks. Um, and so with what Gary was saying about it, I think it's the age old thing with filmmaking anyway, isn't it? There's your idea. There's what ends up being made. Yeah. That's yeah. different yeah. things. Yeah. And yeah. We, we had a bit of a back and forth, to be honest. I wouldn't say arguments, you know, actually we normally argue like cats and bloody dogs on some of the shoots. And as Gary said, this is the closest we've worked together since Hellraiser, I think in this very room till four o'clock in the morning, some weekends, he's part of the furniture. He's my second wife, as I said, <laughs> place still stinks of him. So, um, but I think, uh, you know, I, we, the sort of the, I remember the one argument we kind of had where I was like saying about, right, next project, we really need to map out what's going on. We need to have a vision. You know, it's got to be like this. Blah, blah. To which Gary's then like, well, it's all well and good saying that. But I sat down with Robert. He did, sorry, you know, on that first interview. One question asked, three hours later, he was only ready to ask question two with him. A bit like you probably are now with us. Like, Jesus, I want to get to question three. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I did say, like, we've got to start mapping these things out because you, with documentaries, you've got your evidence, you know stuff generally because we're, you know, we know stuff generally because we're fans, and then you mm-hmm. learn things as you go along, anecdotes. You've got to, one of the most important things I learned was, you know, when you do an interview, pay attention to what the person's oh, yeah. saying. And yeah. I, don't, I think once or twice I might have made that mistake where someone's kind of thrown in the answer I want from the next question on the previous answer, and then when I go... I've switched off just very slightly. I'm like, oh, so, so, uh, what, what was it like uh, applying the vampire makeup effects? I just said that. <laughs> of course, you did. Just yeah. test it. Uh, so, <laughs> you've got to pick up what people say, and in a way, you mm-hmm. can write it, map it, everything you want. The edits kind of find themselves, and that's what I've really started enjoying lately. Is you just you sort of look at everything holistically. You take all your bits and all your pieces. And then you just go, oh, that connects with that. Oh, that goes with that. And then how do we connect it to this story and that story, you know? And hopefully, I think we've, for the most part on these projects, managed to sustain that. Don't just jump from one random thing to another. If you watch archive DVD documentaries now, which they're purely there just to educate you a bit. Sometimes I'm just watching, I'm going, how the fuck did you jump from that topic to that topic? You know, that's what I want is a flow from this person says that onto that, which leads us to this. So... It yeah. kind of it found itself in the edit, but I think the luckiest thing we've had with this, and God, please tell me if we've said this already now. <laughs> I've had too many drinks. Um, <laughs> we got the chance of interviewing Robert four times on this project. Okay. So there's four interviews contained within the documentary, okay. four completely different times, starting at 2019. And the fourth one was actually done after the premiere in Sitches. So mm. we, uh, that was kind of a really awesome uh, situation we had there. So... I think the important thing we've never done before is sit down with someone more than once. I think the closest was the director of Fright Night, Tom Holland. Was that? No, it was just one, wasn't it? We met him first time. Yeah, we were with him a couple of times and it was the last day we shot with him. But to be able to watch how it progresses, his interviews from the first interview where Gary asks one question, Robert's almost got his lines rehearsed. He knows okay. what he's saying. It's, it's the anecdotes he's told probably a million times at conventions yeah. and on panels. The second interview I was there for, which was kind of like retrofit the bits we'd missed, like Eaten Alive and some of the other 70s films, Dead and Buried in particular as well. And then the third interview, again, I wasn't there, but it's where he's got like a twinkling lights in the background. That was the interview Gary had conduct, uh, conducted with him. And that's where he started opening up a bit about his family, his first okay. wife, his mum, his dad. Mm-hmm. So it's really cool to see how our, you know, you've got to gain someone's trust to let them open up a bit yeah. more. I yeah. think one of the biggest things I took from the edit, original edit, I was like, shit, man, he's got no dramas in his life, Robert. There's mm-hmm. no, there's no compelling, shocking, you know, information or revelations or anything, or not like Kane Hodder who had a stunt injury, which sure. was kind of one of the fundamental aspects to his documentary. 
Um, and so I kept sort of saying, where's, where's the drama in this? You know, should we fabricate something? No, God, no. We never, we never lie in these projects. So always got to be honest. But um, once we saw the screening in <clears throat> Sitches last year, we were very happy with it. Robert was happy with it. It got a nice response. Mm. I did kind of look at it like, oh, it kind of slows down in the second half of it. You have this kind of trajectory of like, oh my God, there he is, Robert as a baby. Then mm. into theater, then these films and all these people he met. And then you've got, I keep using this analogy, the scar. It's like Scarface. It's kind of like you're watching this career go up and up and up and up. And then bam, here's the fame, roll the montage kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah. in the second half, it became a little bit like, and there's this film and that film and that film and that film. So by the fourth interview, we'd had time with him. We'd got pretty trashed with him the one night at Sitches. <laughs> Our relationship, and he was he was happy with what he had seen. And so that gave me the opportunity to kind of be like, okay, Robert wants to incorporate the film he starred in with Henry Fonda. How he didn't say that as a film fan that he'd worked with, one of the mm. biggest golden age yeah, Hollywood yeah. actors. He wanted that in there. And my main thing was really that I think we need to address that the 90s weren't a great time for the horror genre, or at least in terms of slashes, because it was yeah. a lot kind of like finding itself again. In the early 90s, every, no one wanted Freddy or Jason anymore. They wanted thought-provoking, Oscar-winning, Science of the Lambs or Seven, psychological thrillers. Mm -hmm. And then like, even though it's a great film, Wes Craven's New Nightmare tanked, and then Scream yeah. kind of revitalized it, literally just afterwards, the same thing. So I felt that was missing the first time. Like, actually, there's not much of a story to be told here. It's sure. just talk about this film, this film, this film. So to be able to weave in the dramatic nature, that's we're not just about facts anymore. I think it's about how can we get a story here? You know, yeah. what? Why, why are we talking about this at yeah. this point? So to be able to kind of address the elephant in the room that 90s were a bit tough for the yeah. horror genre and him, you know, was great. We don't go too, too far, but the fact is I didn't know he bloody started in Disney films before this project. And I yeah. watched one with Dennis Hopper and uh, Paul Walker, God rest his soul, um, which was really weird. It's like, what the hell? Freddy Krueger's in a Disney kids film, you know? <laughs> um, and then I think another great thing we got that last interview was the first interview the guys had done with Robert in 2019 on Stranger Things, there was an embargo. So he couldn't say anything about it. Yeah. It hadn't been. Yeah. So the interview we had up to that point was like, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm in Stranger Things. It's really good. Uh, I COVID auditioned, and that was it. But when we were doing the edit and Stranger Things 4 had come out, I'm like, fuck, man. We, Vecna's yeah. like the modern Freddy Krueger and yeah. blah, 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 blah. And, you know, now we've got images of what he looks like in the film, whereas that point we didn't. So to yeah. be able to actually then get that out of him and get, I think what's a really nice point to it is that the kids that came to see him back in the day at conventions for Freddy Krueger are now adults bringing their kids to say, Oh, look, it's, it's the guy. Oh no, not Freddy Krueger. The guy from stranger things. Yeah. So it kind yeah. of gives the story a bit of a shit. We've got a bit of a sure. full circle thing here now. So it, it, it evolves. And I think, yeah, we, ironically, this has been this smoothest project we've worked on. I think with Pennywise, there was a frame rate issue at the start. We had to get yeah. fixed. There was the approach to Pennywise. I think you were saying about, I mean, I loved the fact we incorporated that um, history of clown section. Yeah. 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 I think the issue we had with Pennywise was, I say it's too many chefs. It's kind of that, but it was where so many angles to approach that. At. We've got a wealth of material to do a massive deep dive on the 90s series. There's no way in hell we were going to get Stephen King, even though people are like, oh, you didn't get Stephen King. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know who he is, but no, nah, we didn't need the set decorator. Yeah. Know? So um, we, we, you know, John got us that amazing university footage at the start, but we didn't address the remake in that. Um, you know, do do we focus on the colrophobia aspects and everything? So that's that's where the difficulty was in that edit. Sure. And add to the fact green screen is just a bitch to do same for robodoc especially for some of my shoddy uh, photography on that um whereas with this natural backgrounds easy going vibe easy sort of story to tell to a certain degree chronicling it but weaving in some dramatic yeah. beats so yeah i mean what three three years really to make this one would you say gary whereas the other one's like <laughs> robodocs in it's uh, seven yeah. year, but finally coming out this year thank god 2019 yeah we started oh, 2018 okay. 2018 was initial Yes, from him. And then 2019 was the production year of the first interview. 
and then we interviewed him again in 2000. The last one was 2021 was the last interview. Oh, okay. No, 22, 22, 2022. What are we now? We're in 2023 now, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> By but the we, end of we this got, interview, it'll be 2025. Yeah, but, yeah, but, we, but we, can blame, we can blame COVID anyway for a lot of, obviously, you know, there was obviously a, a two-year period, basically. We couldn't do anything with regards to yeah. interviews. We had a lot of interviews scheduled, which aren't, aren't now, obviously, in the doc, because they're interviewed, scheduled with people who just couldn't do it because of COVID. And then sure. by the time COVID was over, we had a, we had a really we had a narrative what we were happy with, and we didn't we couldn't go back and interview those people again. Then we couldn't. So there was a few people that didn't make it because of just circumstance, really. Yeah. yeah. Now let's focus on the title of this doc: Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares. I'm sure there were many other ideas for what to name this project, but yeah. what was it that made this title stick? Well, the, the original idea of the title, which me and Chris have spoke about again years ago, I think you know, I've even toward the idea of like a even like a, a a dramatic kind of narrative series with this title and it was called icon and it was called and it was icon the robert e, uh, england story and we i really like that it's just really simple most of our documentaries are leviathan the story of how raise and how about harris too pennywise the story of it you know these bloody long titles which we, we end up then making short by going oh it's just called the brewster doc or it's just called leviathan um so we were quite happy with icon and then when we were shooting, it was called Icon. And then we went to Robert and he signed some posters for us, which I've got on the wall here, which says Icon on it. And then he kind of pulled me aside. No, he was an, e he was an email, actually. And he sent me an email and said, oh, you know, I, I really like the title, but I think it can, it can come across as quite egotistical. That I don't want, you know, I, I don't think I'm an icon, he basically said. And I said, well, you are an icon. He said, well, I don't think I am. I, I think he's... I don't want people to think I'm being egotistical and that look at me, everybody, I'm this iconic mm. kind of character. And he's very, again, because he's got no ego, he's very yeah. much like that. He, he'll put like Vincent Price's iconic status and he gets really kind of like, um, you know, a bit kind of shy is the wrong word for him. He doesn't like accepting the fact that, you know, he gets very modest about stuff like that. So um, it was, uh, he might each email and said, I'd like it to be called Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares. I think he's original, the story, what type was, Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares, The Life and Chronicles of a, a Working Actor, Robert England. I thought, oh, it's a little bit long, Robert. How about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how about Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares, Robert England story? That's but good. We just, how about? We, yeah. we, just call it, we just call it Hollywood Dreams. You know, we ever talk to yeah. people about it. It's just, we make it a little bit shorter. You know, it's Hollywood Dreams. But yeah, and it is really that. It's about, you know, the kind of his journey. There's not much nightmares. I mean, the nightmare, yeah, obviously, yeah. the character that he yeah. played, you know. But it's about a young guy who, and obviously you've watched it, who, you know, um, Parents didn't really want him to be an actor, they wanted him to be a yeah. lawyer, mm -hmm. didn't really have much support from his parents, found a love for theatre in obviously, you know, these kind of summer camps and whatnot. And then, you know, his whole life changed basically when he became an actor and then that affected his first marriage. And then obviously then becoming Freddie made him an icon. So I think it's a really fitting title. Robert loves the title. I think we've had some really nice feedback on it as well. But I yeah. give the man the credit, it's from him, really. He that's okay. a huge awesome. input, really, yeah, yeah. on it. Easier to find on uh, Twitter as well. So if we were just searching, like, oh, what are the reviews? Icon, oh, fucking hell. Yeah. I yeah, Icon yeah. influencer, Icon yeah. this. Yeah. Click on Icon. <clears throat> I mean, that's that's we, we, the... We, we, yeah, but yeah. we still call it Icon sometimes. Like, we'll be talking to people yeah, and we go, oh, yeah, uh, Icon's out next week. And I go, what? Oh, Hollywood Dreams. And we, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's, still, it's still stuck there for us. So, I think the simplest one we've still got has got to be RoboDoc, for sure. Yeah. And, then, Five, and you could yeah, be talking yeah. about the 1989 film or that Russian one. Yeah. If, I mean, if you, you're so cool, Brewster, I suppose, but that gets we, banned we call, about as a quote. We, we, we call mm. it Brewster, don't we, that one? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but Robodoc's the only one, really, apart yeah. from those National Lampoon's film. But otherwise, Robodoc's but, like, fuck, that's just so simple. Boom. But, that's but, it. We, are, yeah. but we, deba we debated about Robodoc at one stage. We are obviously uh, co director and editor, Eastwood wanted to call it, I think, Murphy and the Machines, something like that. And we were like, we like Robodoc, <laughs> and the whole point. Murphy and the Machine sounds yeah. too close to like a 1980s yeah, yeah. band or something, yeah. doesn't it? AOR or something, you yeah, know, yeah. adult oriented I, rock. I Murphy and the Machine, <laughs> Mike and the Mechanics. I believe that's the, the, the title of episode three. I think it is Murphy and the Machine now in that series. Yeah. Um, so he's got it in there finally. He has in, in the series. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, credit to Robert massively on that one for Hollywood Dreams. Awesome. Oh, okay, cool. So this past weekend, Robert appeared at a special screening in Hollywood for Dreams and Nightmares in LA that was put on by Bloody Disgusting and Beyond Fest. Were you guys in town for that? Or did you just guys just see all the pictures uh, and everything? 
we're just the directors, you know, we're nothing. Yeah. Really. Uh, no, it's difficult. It's difficult for us, obviously. You know, it's it's a shame we were gutted. I mean, at one stage, me and Chris were like, we're not bothered. And then yeah. on, on Friday, we're the going, closer, the closer bothered. it got, yeah. the more people who were there it was like, yeah. Fuck it, yeah. I've got to go to uh, pissy Moulin Rouge in the West End with my wife this yeah. weekend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, 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 would, we would have liked to have gone. I think for us to travel there, uh, obviously, just for a weekend, obviously, again, we we have obviously full time jobs still. Yeah. We're balancing all of this obviously around obviously our, our paying our mortgages. Uh, we did contemplate it. it was, we were really close at one stage, but I think we just felt that you know we need to invest that time and money into other uh, elements of obviously the post production. We've got a big screening in London in August, so that's going to be good for us obviously as as, yeah. as obviously as obviously natives of this country. But yeah, it's been amazing. We, again, we were really happy that Mikey was there. You know, Mikey went to represent us on stage. Mikey Perez. Uh, we've watched the 50 minute kind of Q&A at the end uh, and we thought it was brilliant and again kudos to Robert for talking about us getting Chris's name wrong but talking about calling us. me Chris Griffin so yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, seems to call me that but <laughs> I, I, I haven't shared this with Chris yet actually because you know, it came quite late last night and uh, I got an email from Nancy last night Chris just saying oh, that really did you oh, tell, yeah. oh come on then sorry <laughs> yeah. we're with Gary Smart what, director what, what, of uh, what, what, did, what did she say so yeah but I think you know Robert really enjoyed it there and I think you know for us she put here the screening went great on Saturday for love Nancy mm. and then I got two pictures sent to me but it says on there do not share with Chris so you know I won't um, but, uh, it's because of, of the hotel room in Sitges, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, probably. Yeah, but we true. did, we did. I mean, I suppose the one thing with that screen as well, we got. I mean, like, we we do it for the love of the game, and as Gary said, you know, we could have been egotistical. I mean, I would have had to have got a mortgage out again, but you know, to come <laughs> over to watch a screening. Mm. But Gary's right; we've never been in it for the money. This, although you know there's conceptions out there that all oh, these people do kickstarters and run off with our money it's like fucking hell man we've just given you a 20 minute preview of something what do you, you know people do run their mouths these keyboard warriors online yes but yeah we <laughs> did we did get to enjoy like the luxury of this project i mean like it was a whirlwind getting to go to Sitches film festival mm -hmm. and i kind of anticipated this in a way right but you know i'm more than aware we're riding on the coattails we're riding on the backs of previously existing franchises ips you know mm -hmm. new filmmakers out there who are out to make themselves you know that's the challenge whereas with us like boom we've got this big ip let's ride on the coattails so to go to searches with robert and kind of experience that the premiere and you know him getting swarmed by fans and that's one of the most impressive things of the guy you know it, he gets absolutely mobbed by people out there and yet he will stay to sign all their stuff. God knows, yeah. he, you know, you might look a bit tired, but how gracious he is with people like that yeah. was absolutely yeah. beyond me. But, um, you know, we got to watch, you know, experience the film for the first time with him, um, admittedly. And I think going what Gary said before as well, that's interesting. He can talk for the US. He can talk for the whole world, to be honest. Yeah. And he is passionate about what he does. He is very kind of almost outspoken, but... He's not egotistical. And what was interesting is that actually for the watching it the first time, Nancy, we saw him on the Friday night, had a couple drinks with him. And again, you know, I've only met him once by this point, but he knew who I was straight away. So I was like, oh, he knows my name. <laughs> and he got it right that time. He didn't call me, you know, Peter Griffin's son. But um, <laughs> yeah, we, his wife said, oh, Robert wants to watch it. And Gary hadn't arrived at this point. He's got a closer relationship with Robert by this point. And I'm like... Fuck, he's on a flight. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure we can get a laptop to you to watch it before it screens the next day or whatever. Okay, that's good. Cool, Gary. Gary, quick, come! I don't know what they they want to watch it. So anyway, <laughs> cut to the next morning. Um, and we'd had a good few drinks the night before. Nancy texts me to say about oh we want to watch it today. I'm like oh have the people of the festival organized a laptop for you guys to watch it in your room? Oh no no no, we'll we'll come up to your room and watch it. Uh, mine and my wife. So I'm like oh. Fuck, because I've just gone for a massive shit. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, look, okay, look, we'll, we'll, we'll sort something out. Why don't we come down to your room? Oh, no, no, we're in the lobby now. <laughs> Fuck, what room are you in? Um. Oh, God, babe, open the windows, open the windows, quick, get the, get the Febreze, do call an exorcist, I don't know what. So that was really awkward, but they came and watched it in our room. <laughs> And there's a photo somewhere online, but it, it looked like the weirdest kind of like porno was being shot because you've got those two <laughs> double beds jammed together. Robert sat on the desk watching it on this very laptop I'm talking to you now on. Um, 
and we're there and like obviously these anecdotes you know the, the cocaine story from Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street 2 yeah. uh, really you know little moments where we're a bit like oh god is this pushing it too far in this day and age where um, Bill Cap from Kerry alludes to the fact that guys back in the 70s were horny devils you know and yeah. oh when you strip to the side of a stage you might get a peek at a girl yeah yeah Oh, dude, yeah, it's really tough if we can address that these days. But that's why I wanted to keep in that honest thing where he kind of cracks at the end and goes, "Oh, I, oh, I'm not sure if I, oh, should I say that anymore? Yeah. Let's let's embellish yeah. it with a bit of comedy." So we were sat there. Gary and Adam came to our room, and we were all just sat like lying on this bed together. Me, my wife, Gary, Adam, looking like the weirdest porn you'll ever watch. And then Robert and his and, Nat, and his wife Nancy sat on chairs watching the documentary for the first time at a festival on my laptop of all things. Uh, and so that was really nerve wracking. But what was interesting is he kind of did sort of say like, you know, I'd rather watch it like this, you know, yeah. that kind of anxiety, even I get, you know, like, Oh God, we've got to show our film or show something to an audience, you know? Mm -hmm. So you start to get a bit more humble and nervous. And it was just so endearing to watch someone who's so confident, who knows all this stuff. has got this amazing career behind him. Just sort of be like, oh, I'm a bit nervous to watch this. You know, I don't want to look egotistical and everything. So, but, it, it, you know, we we experienced that. And we got to do the Q&As, the photo shoots. So it was like, oh, glamour pusses. I tried dressing like Harrison Ford circa 1980s, albeit with a bit more uh, weight on me. But um, we got to experience that. And so, yeah, the premiere happened the other day. And it looked like it went down really, really well. Yeah. So I just wanted to kind of go back to one of the things you said. I know we have to wrap up. We're getting short on time. But like you, I know that like you said, you know, we're kind of on the coattails of these large franchises, but you definitely cannot downplay the amount of work that goes into making a documentary of this stature, like for any of the ones that you've done, like you're taking right. large bodies of work. And the thing about like where you guys stand is you are now looked at as experts. So like, not only do you guys have to create something, but you also have to be able to like answer and you know, like just, you have to know your stuff. So good, you know, good for you guys for making like such quality work that everybody is enjoying. I cannot wait for more people to see this documentary. Yeah. Um, we're, you know, when we got the opportunity to watch it early, I was like, hell yes. Like yeah. Freddie is, is my go-to. So like to actually get to see like the other side of Robert England was really like cool. Yeah. and. Mm -hmm not something that like I really had been able to experience before. So thank you guys for kind of bringing that to us. And for all the docs, like I said, like the Pennywise one, I was telling Brandon, like last week I was, we were talking about this and I was like, I freaking loved that Pennywise one so much. So like, you know, you guys, the, the work that you guys are doing is, is amazing. So thank you guys for making these, these films about the stuff we love. I really appreciate that, man. As yeah. I said, we, we do it because we're fans. And I think, yeah. you know, for the issues we have, I hope, and, you know, I always use that as a statement. If we didn't do it, I'm not saying no one else would, but it takes, I think, the geeks like us yeah. to see these things through. Sure. You could get a studio. Warner Brothers could do like, a, you know, would Warner Brothers bother going back to the TV movie? Their, their mind is now, no, 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 Bill Skarsgård, Pennywise, and this and that, you know. So... For us to be able to kind of like it justifies basically being an anorak. So all that, all that <laughs> shit I bore the majority of people I know with, you know, yeah. to be able to put that into practice, um, and you know, it, it ultimately what we want to do is tell the stories, honor these things, and just put out the best documents that explain why they're so loved. You yeah. know, so it's Absolutely. it's never been about the money for us. It's always been. Yeah, about I think I think it's really important as well to say you know these things take time because we could easily rush them we could you know and we talk yeah. about it and we have excuses all the time and then sometimes we bit by off more we can chew and you know we know we've taken on three four projects at once and our blueprint originally for leviathan and hellraiser went uh, leviathan and bruce went went to part however it would be easy for us just to get a quick edit out you know it'd be so much easier to do that but it's getting it right we've got to be happy with it you know we've got to make sure that as fans we are 100 percent and we can't you know sometimes with people you don't always please we're really humbled about the, the feedback on this one i think we really are i think you know everybody's been so nice about it we you know we've had i think i've read a couple of letterboxed kind of reviews but um you know which you're always gonna get your keyboard warriors who, 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 who've got an opinion but for yeah. us we 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 know that robert enjoyed it and i know it sounds cliche but the fact robert has appreciated the work that's gone into it and robert 
as actually retaking something from it. That's what we wanted to achieve. So having people like yourself say it's great is an absolute is a bonus for us. Mm -hmm. Having Robert literally give us a hug and you know and say thank you, and we go he sent us a gift. You know uh, each me Adam and Chris and and, and oh, ask me as well, isn't it? <laughs> You know, I only had one drink. Me, Chris, and Adam sent us a, a, a gift each and a little note for saying, you know, I really appreciate what you've done. Thank you. That means everything to us, I think, as yeah. filmmakers and as fans of him. So, you know, it's kind of humbling and it's kind of been an experience. But I think the most important thing for us, we've developed as filmmakers. I think we've really, I believe we have. I'm really looking forward to the next project because I think what we've learned from this project is to do something fresh soon. Yeah. Where all the baggage is away from it. It's just fresh. I think that's going to be great for us, I think, to do that. Awesome. Yeah. Everybody, Hollywood Dreams, Nightmares, the Robert England story on Screenbox in digital June 6th. Make sure you check it out. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank I, you. Enjoy it. Sorry we chewed your ears off, mate. <laughs> no, no. We really appreciate you guys. So thank you so much. No, thank, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Everybody, thank have a great night and thanks for listening. Thank you. Ciao, guys. Take it easy.